for the life, life Today Live launched and has been a ridiculously successful uh, little bit of broadcasting. And that's because of you guys, you guys that share and subscribe and follow. You, you've made this work and I keep getting great guests because they know that there's an audience out there. So thank you for that. I want to thank you for that. So three more programs this year. Tomorrow, Mark Driscoll talking about what you do in a culture that is increasingly rejecting Christ. Straight out of Scripture. Love Mark Driscoll. And Wednesday, I have someone scheduled who will be very interesting. What do you talk about after 2020? Coronavirus. So I've got a doctor who stirred up some controversy, got in a little bit of trouble, and by not toting the CDC line. And so he's scheduled on Wednesday. Uh, it'll be a good week. It'll be a fun week. And then I will be gone for the rest of the year. See you again in 2021. But today, it's Christmas week. So what should, I don't know, what should we talk about? We should talk about something related to Christmas. <laughs> so I have someone who is, uh, a, has done some fascinating work. As a former professor at Texas A&M, Gigam Aggies, they should be in the, uh, the, the college playoffs, but that's a different story. Um, he has done some documentaries. He's got a new one out, but we're going to talk about it. And I'll, show, I'll show you real quick the, the two set of, uh, of his DVDs. It's called Heaven and Earth. And the, the Earth part of this, the second movie, is brand new. We'll take a look at that a little bit later. But the, the first one is one that he did a few years ago. It's called The Star of Bethlehem. And we're looking at it from a, a standpoint of, of, of you know, facts, uh, and we take the Bible as fact, but scientifically, how, do, how does that work? How, how, how is that possible? What was it? Was it a star? Was it a planet? Was it an angel? What, what's going on with this star of Bethlehem? Was it just a nice story? I would be fine with that too. I love nice stories because we know Not Christ me. is real. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so there he is. You hear him in the background. He doesn't like just nice stories. So Rick Larson is my guest. He's the producer of these films and um, someone who has taken a deep dive into this star, and he's going to tell us about it today. Rick, how you doing, man? I'm doing all right. Thank you, Randy. So I, give me the short version, if you would, of, of <laughs> why you, because I really want to I want to spend time on this star of Bethlehem, but I'm curious why you went from, uh, you know, lawyering and professoring to uh, filmmaking. Yeah, I still do some professoring and lawyering, yeah, but really this has taken over my life. It's nuts. Uh, I'll tell you, that, like, everybody wants to know that because it's so unlikely because I'm not trained as an astronomer, and yet I'm doing this deep dive. So in a nutshell, um, I live in a neighborhood in central Texas where there are about, you know, three or four dozen homes. And uh, I was a young man in the neighborhood. He was a high schooler, had an idea for making a little bit of money. He decided, well, we're all going to do the same uh, decorations in our neighborhood this year. And so he went around. It was late. It was probably November. Anyway, he went to everyone door to door, showed them pictures in a book. They were supposed to pick out a character. He's cutting them out of plywood, setting them up in the yard, putting a light on there, storing them in the off season charging an annual fee. It was a great idea to make some money, but also kind of a cool idea for making the neighborhood sing as one, so to speak. So I don't have any problem with the idea. The trouble was, Randy, is that uh, it was the choice of characters because they were all cartoon characters, like bunnies carrying presents and stuff like that. And I'm a deeply committed Christian. So I thought, you know, I, I think Christmas is about Christ. So I blew it totally. I declined. I just couldn't go there. So here's why I say I blew it because everybody else did it, you know, and the whole neighborhood lit it up. It looked great. It really did. Honestly, it really did. And we called it, people were driving in from actually some distance to see this neighborhood. And they'd be driving along and the kids were looking out the car windows and they're having a great time and clearing away the sprouts to see and until they get to the Larson home, which is dark, you know, and the kids are saying, oh, look, Daddy, here's where the atheist lives. You know, it's like, because I didn't have people in my yard, you know? So anyway, uh, I was caught out and had to make some arrangement fast. My daughter and I, we, this is just the way it happened. I mean, she was about waist high at that time. We ran into the garage. I had some chicken wire, rolled it. We crumpled that stuff up to make you know, frames and, and put some lovely fabric on and made three wise men that we put in the front yard. Okay, so how's that relevant? Well, here's why it's relevant. She asked this fateful question that caused all the trouble. She said, Daddy, we have the wise men, don't, don't we need to have a star? And so Daddy says, well, yes, I guess we do, honey, you know? 
Daddy, make a start. Well, okay, I'll do that. Trouble is, is Daddy's a lawyer. And, you know, the gears start turning. And, and I'm thinking, okay, I'll make a star, but I just can't make up something. I got to try to do something accurate. So I started trying to figure that's the same thing you kind of talked about as we began. What was it? Was it an angel? Was it a shooting star? What did it do? How long did it last? Uh, was it the Shekinah glory of God? Or was it made up by the early church? Dad, wait the name of Jesus of Nazareth? That was... I just had to figure it out. So I started what became, well, first weeks, months, and then years worth of study on that topic and discovered what has become a film. Actually, didn't get to film first. First, it took over my life. And, um, you know, when you talk to people in ministry, you're probably going to hear this more than once. I was tricked. You know, I, I, I had no intention of ministry. I was trying to make a decoration for my yard. But, but, you know, but after studying, I was teaching a course at my church about essentials, the biblical basis of the core beliefs of Christianity. And, and, and I decided, well, I'm going to carve a little space in there to use, you know, talk about external evidences, things outside the Bible that tend to show the Bible is true. So I did what my presented my research on the star. And it went nuts from there. I was getting requests from other churches. Pretty soon I'm going all over the country. Get a crazy phone call from a guy. I didn't understand who he was about, what he was about for about 10 minutes. He just kept talking about Kosovo. And I'm thinking, Kosovo, okay, what are we doing here? Toward the end, he finally says, you know, so I want you to go to the University of Krishna in Kosovo and present the star. And I'm going, aren't, aren't they killing people in Kosovo? And he said, well, not everyone. And I said, okay, so. So I went and I did that and then so from there it's Albania, Slovakia, and, and Italy, China, every, it was too much. It took over my life. So we needed a film. And that's why we have a film like the one that you probably looked at recently, Randy. And a brief, a brief statement about what happened with that film because this is also kind of nutty. It shows God's hand is there, it ain't me. I'm not taking credit for it because I just live in central Texas and never made a film before. Um, one day uh, my distributor, calls me and he says, you know, Rick, you've got the best selling documentary in the world. And I said, oh, great, terrific, what's for lunch? You know, because I didn't believe it. I mean, how would he even know that? I really honestly did not believe it. But I got interested and started watching and look at, here it comes on Amazon. First it's, you know, number one in special interest and number one in whatever, whatever. And pretty soon they wipe out away all the qualifiers and it's just the best selling documentary on Amazon, which blew me away. I'm an indie producer. If you make an indie DVD, you're lucky if you sell 5,000 copies. We've now sold over 400,000 copies. Nice. Um, and now it's gone streaming, of course. It's available from you know Apple and Amazon and Hulu and all that everywhere. Um, so you know that? I have one question, one question for you that may seem like, a, a, I'm curious, you, you mentioned you were teaching this in your Sunday school class. What kind of church, I'm curious. Uh, actually, it's non-denominational. Uh, that's it's real important to me. There's, I, I'm just a Bible-believing Christian. No, no, no. I get that. I get that. I, I'm, I'm what I was looking at and say non-denominational helps me none. But sort of your personality type, because you seem with the lawyer background, obviously, you seem like the type that uh, you don't settle for an answer easily. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. 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 I do believe in the authority of Scripture. But the way I study scripture and teach scripture may be a little different because I take everything at face value and I want to figure out what that means. Yeah. I don't like to read over things, especially Jesus, who is really a difficult person. He says difficult to handle stuff often. And we sort of get comfortable with just not going through what he's saying. You know? <laughs> right, right. No, you I'm know? that way too. <laughs> I'm, to I'm totally that way. I'm a five on the Enneagram. If you know what that means, you'll get that. But So, yeah. so let's, let's jump to uh, the, what you found out. What, what did you discover? What is that star? Okay. okay, first thing I discovered, I'm a researcher by trade. That's what I do as a lawyer. So I pushed pretty hard into the research. It was the kind of thing that, you know, you, Randy, if you'd seen me doing it, you might have gotten it, I suppose. People who are not believers looked at me and I was spending hours outside on the deck every single night for weeks and months. They, you know, basically, you know, OCD, if you didn't, if you weren't a believer. If you're a believer, you recognize, oh, no, he's probably got a calling. It's the same thing, but uh, oh, I spent untold hours. And um, first thing I discovered that really disappointed me is that there was no consensus at all 
on what the star of Bethlehem was. It made me crazy because everything in the night sky has been proposed. So that came, though, from the lack of attention to Matthew, just like, don't do that. I'm talking. Um, uh, anyway, uh, no, oh, they can't hear. Well, I still like well, They now know what you've just done. Geek off. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Um, Okay, so I found I just I figured out though that the wide variety of conclusions was because people were not tracking Matthew carefully. I went through Matthew very closely. You know, you know the kind of comb you use to get the fleas off your cat. I went through Matthew like that and looking for the clues. Came up with nine. You know, and that's a fair amount of data. So once you have that much data, you can start eliminating all the things that have been tossed out as that, maybe that's a star, maybe that's a star, maybe that's a star, and it, it's, and it, it narrows it pretty quickly. Uh, incidentally, there's a lot of my research on Bethlehemstar.com because when I presented at universities all over the world, and the problem is I tend to speak quickly, and one common reaction is, whoa, cool, what do you say, you know? so. I had to have a backup for that for people to go study it themselves. So that's that's out there at BethlehemStar.com. Um, so what I found was those nine points that identify the actual star of Bethlehem. Some of them are obvious. Some of them are not. Let's do the three most obvious. When the Magi show up in Jerusalem looking for the baby, they ask, where is he who has been born king? of the Jews. So obviously whatever they saw in the sky, they associated it with birth and kingship and the Jewish people. Okay, that's those are easy ones. Um, another moderate easy one, they see the star from the east, probably Babylon. There's a lot of discussion there. We don't have time for it probably, but okay, but they travel all the way to Jerusalem then. Don't know if they walked on foot, don't know if on horses or on the traditional camels. We have no way of knowing that. Don't know the route they took, probably the Fertile Crescent, but we don't know. Anyway, it took a long time, that being 700 miles, to get to Jerusalem, and they still saw the star. So it lasted over time. So there was a book published just two years ago claiming that the star Bethlehem was a shooting star. Uh, shooting stars don't last four months, you know. In other words, people are not paying attention to Matthew. So <laughs> that's four of the, of the five, of the nine. Um, let me skip over a bunch of stuff and go to the hard one. The one that knocks you right out of the box if you're trying to do it scientifically and just trying to stand up in front of a university audience in front of professors you cannot wave your hands and do a little dance up there you know it doesn't work when it says the star stopped over the place where the child was you got problems because everybody knows about inertia everybody knows stars don't stop so i mean i was really stumped to a degree there until i realized that i had the problem upside down uh, and that kind of solved itself. And the problem is not that stars can't stop. The problem is that all stars are always stopped. They move, you know, at the speed of the hour hand on your watch. You can't see it. So there has to be another explanation for that. And it turns out the explanation is what astronomers call retrograde motion. Um, as the planets move through the, the field of fixed stars, they, they actually appear to stop and change direction. Well, why would they do that? It's because we're watching from a moving platform. We're riding around the solar system on Earth. Yeah. And just like when you're on the freeway and you pass a car, you know, it looks like it drops back. Is it going backwards? No, it's just that you're watching from a moving platform. Same thing. So we spin past planets as we travel around the, the sun and it makes all kinds of interesting things appear to happen. So. Uh, the, the major player in the nine points, which is a long story, it's not one event, it's a series of events described by Matthew, uh, would be Jupiter. And Jupiter did indeed stop over the little town of Bethlehem at a perfectly relevant time. Um, so you're saying that the star of Bethlehem was actually the planet Jupiter? Well, it was a conjunction. It was the brightest star anyone alive had ever seen. Well, how is that possible? Well, there was a conjunction, which just means a close approach mm -hmm. optically. You know, mm -hmm. they could be a bazillion miles away from one right. another. Right. But when they come together, uh, Jupiter and Venus, this time, stacked like a figure eight, each contributing their full brightness. Jupiter's the largest planet in the solar system. Venus is the brightest. So you're talking about a very bright star. And then in, indeed, the bright, and this is mathematically uh, correct. It's not just my assertion. It was the brightest star anyone alive had ever seen, and, or you either. Um, 
no one has ever seen a star that bright, apart from the sun and the moon, brightest thing in the sky. Um, so that was the star of Bethlehem. But there's a whole lot more to the story. The fun part of it is, you know, if you like the Bible, and if you're critical, both, is that, you know, think about math for a minute, stickler, uh, maybe even maybe even boring. I mean, I, I don't know how you think about his genealogies, but I mean, the guy was detailed, you know, everything mm -hmm. was details to Matthew. Mm -hmm. um, and so he has these nine points for the star, but he's not a scientist, but he's got these nine points that you can find there if you work. Mm -hmm. He nailed it. Nine, even five itty bitty little points that you can take from his writings, from his, his record, line up perfectly with what we see in the sky at the appropriate time. Now, uh, now, is this is this the same idea that, that, that Jupiter and Saturn align for a, a time from our perspective, yes. but then past, but then yes. because of the, the phenomenon you're talking about where they seem to go in reverse, which is again the moving platform of the Earth, came yes. back together, which is why they lost the star for a while, searched, and then it saw it again and finished their journey? Is, is this the same theory? I'm not sure I can go there, but it's but, but what you're saying is not far off point. Okay, okay. I mean, that's the kind of thing that can happen, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm so, thinking, I'm thinking, but, let, but I think I'm going to drop a bomb here because I know that we're going to change subjects, and I think I should say this before we do that. Go for it. Uh, what 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 I as exciting as star the finding the star was and matching Matthew's nine points, I really think. The most amazing thing, the thing that dropped my jaw was not that. It was learning, figuring out the star was the beginning of what I think of as a celestial poem that begins at Christ's birth, but ends at his execution. And that poem, which people see in the film, I lay it out for them. Let me just tell you what happened to me, and that's let me give it a, my personal reaction to what, what I found. When I realized what I was seeing. I was outside, I'm sorry, I can point right over there. Uh, I was outside on the deck, wet cheeks, look at the sky, and said, you know, my God, what did you do? Because it is, honestly, that part of the presentation, which I did have done all over the world, has actually had some people fall out of their chairs, but a more common reaction is tears. Uh, and, and that falling out of the chairs thing is, I like to say that, Stunningly, it's true. I mean, I thought that was the kind of thing that was kind of made up. No, right there, in the front row, out of the chair. Um, so that poem, that celestial poem, is the most magnificent thing about the star, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that poem plays out at the cross, mm -hmm. which is, I'm sure, part of the reason I wound up doing the Christ quake, which we'll get to at whatever time is right yeah. time to do that. Yeah, we're about to. But, yeah. So um, what I would say about the star of Bethlehem, though, is you really can't miss it because one of the most common responses that I get is we've made this a family tradition. And that's been going on for years. And they, I mean, I, this, I haven't heard that once or twice. I've heard it hundreds and hundreds of times from all over the world. Um, another thing is kind of fun. Just check it out. This, this is a challenge to your people right now. Right now, go to, go to BethlehemStar.com. Go to any place in the study and look on the right-hand side of the page. You're going to see a world map. It has dots on it from where there have been visitors. Their dots for visitors are red. The world is red, apart from the Gobi Desert and things like that where there's no internet. And there will be dots flashing there. Those are the people who are online with you right now. And mm. it's kind of fun to get on there and see, well, somebody's on China with me right now yeah. and Australia and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. It's amazing interest. People really love knowing the star was real. That is very stimulating. Which is very cool. And, and, and I, I don't want to get too absorbed in something that is not the major part of the story. Because, yes, cool. Okay, planets lined up. How do they do it? Fascinating to me. It actually happened. Why did it happen? And that's what I hear you talking about. What was the yes. significance in our lives today? And that is, yeah. of course, the story of Christ. But when you see the science and, uh, and the, the heavens declaring His glory... It's really cool, really cool. I'm, real, we, I, I don't want to go down this tra this trail. But are you familiar with the Matsaroth at all? Sure. Okay. 
Now nah, that's a whole other one. We we should have a conversation later. But right now, <laughs> so I want people to see that they can get the uh, the Star of Bethlehem. That's the so the heaven and earth is the the two DVD package, and you can see the first DVD kind of slipping out there. It's one in the middle. If you're threat, Star if you're of Bethlehem. To show the trailer. Let me show, let me tell them very briefly how that happened. I made the second film. We can tell that story in a minute. And I didn't know before I saw both films sitting on my desk what God had had me do. I had not planned it out. We know from scripture, we hear it all the time, Jesus prayed, in fact, to uh, the Lord of heaven and earth. And the, the Old Testament, Lord of heaven and earth. All, and we all know that's his name. And I'm looking at these two movies sitting here, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, there's the facts. The proof, he's Lord of heaven, the star, mm -hmm. and earth, the Christ quake, right there. Oh, go, that's up, go put it in the box. That's what I've been doing all these years making that set mm -hmm. so that that's why we're talking about this set now yeah okay so the new one is the christ quake and to really give you a good picture of this and to show you a little bit of what you're going to see in these documentaries visually from a production standpoint i want you to watch this and we'll be right back and we'll talk about the christ quake when i first started looking i thought there's not going to be any way you can tell anything about a quake that happened 2,000 years ago because the evidence has kind of been walked on. And then I heard about the phenomenon of the Dead Sea. Really, it's the history of Rome. It's, it's almost the history of Western government. As Christ is expiring on the cross, there is a great earthquake. It's big enough that it split the temple veil from top to bottom, and it broke rocks. John thought it was worth shaking the earth on these people's feet at the end of Christ's work. He's telling us something big. I think he set it up so we could discover that these things happened 2,000 years later. As a physician with Rick, I'm often concerned about where we're going to go and what we're going to be doing. I know we're going to the Dead Sea. We're going to be climbing around in canyons, and basically, he can't feel his legs and his feet. When I first started studying the Dead Sea, I mean, these rivers, these wadis were nothing like this. They were much narrower. The evidence is disappearing. Even though it is rock, it's disappearing. Take a look here. That's a sinkhole. And the sea withdrew, and down it goes. I think what we're looking for is probably about two and a half meters above this layer. Problem is, I can't reach it. There's a seismite right here that's my big suspect. Yeah. No, 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 no. Is it possible that I could somehow see the evidence today, touch the evidence today? Is there a story in rock? Would it be possible to touch the rocks of history and hear? This is the Christ. So that is the new one, and it is available now, The Christ Quake, uh, and the producer, Rick Larson, is our guest today. And this is the second part. This is the Earth part of the Heaven and Earth 2, two package DVD, if you like, um, if you still got one of those. Uh, so this is, this is interesting um, because, yes, we all understand that the heavens you know, declares His glory. We read that in Scripture, and whether, I mean, when you see it, it is literal as well. Um, but but what about the earth? The earth declaring His glory. This is this is interesting. This is a little bit different than what you hear on most Christmas weeks in church. <laughs> yeah, it is. What'd you see? Uh, um, I'll tell you what I like to do. I'm going to read. It's very brief. Uh, the back. This is this is what we're talking about. This set of the two DVDs. And I know DVDs are getting rare. Actually, there's still a lot of people like to have them on their shelf. Anyway, on the back it says, "This is God's show and tell." His word tells us again and again, he is Lord of heaven and earth. And now, in the 21st century, he has chosen to show us. The Gospels are not fiction. They are records. Where they touch the natural order, we can test them. When we do, we find that scientific fact of sky and earth 
are perfectly consistent with those records. These films tell that story. Okay, so that's the spirit of what I do. I'm a documentarian. I'm not saying it's bad to look at inspirational films. Wonderful. If you like them, do so. I'm a fact guy. And so was Paul. And Paul basically called the early believers idiots if these things were not true. I mean, he really was pretty hard on that concept. Christianity is a fact faith based faith. So after I did Star, and the response was so outrageous, I had a lot of pressure from you know all, everyone. What are you going to do next? What are you going to do next? What are you going to do next? And, 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 and I didn't know I was going to make the first film. And my response, first response is, I don't know that I'm doing anything next. Because unless God tells me what to do, I'm not, I'm not a filmmaker. And I don't, nothing would be the short answer. That didn't play. I kept open to it. I'm almost open to what the Lord's going to do. Um, and then, so I started thinking, well, if I were to do anything else, what is my interest? My interest is showing that the factual statements in the Bible, particularly the ones that seem nuts that surround Jesus, are the ones most interest to me. Because if, uh, if they're not right, I mean, I want to know that. So I was looking to, at Matthew again. You know, show me, I wanted to see in the scriptures, what's another place where the stories touch on the natural order, where Rick Larson can go and see? Um, and then I realized, well, the quake, and when I first saw the quake there, and you know, at first I thought, well, it's not going to, I mean, I'm not going to be able to prove anything about that quake. It's 2,000 years ago, unless it knocked a building down that I can show. How am I going to show a quake existed? And then any evidence on the ground would be kicked by kids and turned to laggards for hopscotch or whatever. I mean, it just, I didn't know how it would work. So I assumed it wouldn't. But I started doing the research and quickly found I was wrong. And now it's true that we, you know, seismographs, scientific seismographs been around, what, 120 years, something like that. So we're not going to be looking at scientific instrumentation, I thought. We're going to be guessing at it from what's happened to buildings or something. Water courses. I didn't know. Um, but then I found out about the phenomenon of the Dead Sea. Of course, I knew it was there, but I didn't know what it was doing. The Dead Sea is actually not a sea, it's a terminal lake. It is the lowest place on Earth. Any water that arrives there comes in primarily through the Jordan River and from uh, local rainfall, which is scarce. At the Dead Sea, it rains less than an inch a year. But water comes in from the watershed surrounding, which includes Jerusalem. The Dead Sea is, as the crow flies, 15 to 17 miles from Golgotha. Now, you've got this body of water. It's evaporating all the time, but no water's flowing out, which means the salt levels are rising to the point where nothing botanical can survive in it. No fish, no plants, it's dead. Seems to me. That also means that there's very little current in the Dead Sea. So when water comes in from the surrounding watershed, from the Jerusalem watershed, and enters the Dead Sea, it's carrying sediments. And when it enters, it doesn't, instead of being kicked around by the fish and all that, you know, it just gradually settles just like dust in a still room. And it, it forms layers, page after page. They're very thin, page after page. You, the Dead Sea is a database. It is, as far as I know, the only seismograph that's been running for thousands of years. And it just so happens that it's located right next to Jerusalem, telling us exactly what happened in Jerusalem. Well, how does it tell us that? Well, as the, as the sediment settles, it's all smooth and it's just layers, just flat, clear layers, unless there's an earthquake. And while the sediment layers are new, they are softer. So if there's a quake, when they're still soft, they get busted up. Those are called seismic. And they're extremely readily visible in the strata of the Dead Sea. So. The amazing thing is, is we have a, a, a seismograph that records, you know, usually when you're talking earthquakes, you're talking thousands of years one way or the other, not with the Dead Sea. We're talking about an individual year. If you can get a reference year from which to count, you can count the strata and you can say, okay, there was a quake in this year. Sometimes you can divide it by seasons. It's astonishing. The, the, the granularity of this seismograph that God built right next to Jerusalem. Gee, I wonder why. Anyway, so I can tell you to a certainty that there was a quake that corresponds to Matthew's account in 33 AD when Christ was executed in Jerusalem. And to be able to say that as a scientific fact is almost nuts.
that I can tell you that. Not only that, I can show you that because I'm, I, I want to take, I do teach, I'm a teacher. I've taught for many years at the university level. Um, I want to take my viewers with me. I don't want to just tell them something. I could do a talking head video. I could do that, but I, won't, I that's not what this film is. Christ Quake takes you there into the Dead Sea and shows you what any scientist will see trying to do what I did. And um, it's a kick. And not only that, there are a lot of other interesting things. Not only is it beautiful, but you're also going to see the Judean desert. You have no idea what it looked like where Jesus went to pray. It says he went into the wilderness to pray. Mm. Just go look at the film. Mm. Now yeah. you'll see what he Oh you, you, you say that from a scientific standpoint, it's it's nuts, and I mean, you you by nuts you mean like wow, like yes. cra crazy that yes. such a thing exists. And I think it's exactly. really cool, really it, it's, cool. It's 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 actually thrilling when <laughs> yeah, you realize right, right. when you put it all together because you got to have so many things. God had to do so many things to make that happen. You have to have. Uh, the, the lowest spot on earth so no water escapes. You've got to have it near Jerusalem. You've got to have a watershed that serves Jerusalem. You've got to have, you know, all, and just a million things had to come together. And that's what the film's about, to show how God showed us two things, I would say, many more probably, that he is the Lord of earth. He runs the show down here. He shook it when Christ was on the cross. He dignified that event when Christ said, it is finished, paid in full. Bam! Earthquake hit. That's the Christ quake. And it's like the gavel of God. Bam! Yes, you're right. Yeah. Paid in full. Yeah. And, and it's... Uh, it, and, it's and, yeah. It's a goosebumps. It's and a goosebumps. It, it is reflected in heaven and earth. Uh, and yep. you can witness both of them in Rick Larson's DVD set. Um, and it, I love this because it's... Um, it's one thing to sit and have a conversation about it. It's another thing to see it visually and in mm, a cinematic absolutely. kind of platform where you really, you, like you say, you get taken there. And so, yes. man, I, I appreciate I appreciate your obsession and I appreciate you acting on your obsession. Uh, and it, it's very, very. I cool think I'm thing. weird, but I'm glad I did it. I, you know, <laughs> but the other, I know I've known enough people in the movie industry to know that the brilliant ones are a little different, <laughs> different breed. So. I think you're cut out just for this. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, let me tell you one, uh, something else. I got to say this. Everybody looking at my eyeballs right now has got an aunt or an uncle or a best bud from college or some of your roommate or whatever who you really like. Good person or gal. But if you say Jesus Christ, ice wall goes up yep. and that's out. Everybody has people we love that have that ice wall that travels with them. This, this busts that ice wall. How does it do that? Well, it's a Trojan horse because everyone's interested in mysteries, scientific, historical, objective fact breaks down resistance. No one has said no to hearing about Jesus this way. I, so everybody's, everybody's got a practice means of saying, nah, you know, whatever. I don't want to hear about Jesus. So but they're not practiced at rejecting this stuff. How, how has the scientific community responded to this? Um, that surprised me. I was almost scared when I made the star. <laughs> I don't know why I was scared, but just because I'm not a scientist, I guess. What I am is an aggressive researcher. That's really all. Um, I expected some, to have some kind of blowback, but I didn't. I really didn't. Um, I would say, you know, the biggest sticking point on star would be that the, the, in most seminaries, the date for Herod's death is taught as 4 BC, when the best, freshest scholarship is more consistent with 1 BC. And there's a story there I'd love to tell you, but it's kind of long. But, but anyway, so I have heard from some Christians, but not scientists, but not because science. In fact, if you go to BethlehemStar.com, you're going to see a bunch of endorsements go across, and, and, and they're from people like the uh, the president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and from NASA, and da, 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 da. and they're all pro. And the guy from the, the uh, uh, Association for the Advancement of Science is not a believer. I mean, he's a noted atheist. He's 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 gone now. But I mean, when he gave me that comment, I was like, "You said that." I'm going to put that on my website, you know? <laughs> so, so just, you know, he said, he, he said something like, you know, excellent wide ranging scholarship, which is like a deadly review from a person like that. So, um, they don't, they so don't say that lightly. 
No. <laughs> that you is know? great. Yeah, no, so no, the response from scientists is good. Well, the science on it is solid. I mean, everything I say in that, I'm not a person who can, I cannot stand up in front of a group of any size and say anything that I know to be false or not know to be true. I'm just not that person. I'm a lawyer. That's, you know, you get creamed in court if you say something mm -hmm. that someone can prove. Mm -hmm. I say things that I know where I've got the back end filled in, where I've done the research and I know I stand on firm ground. That's what I'm going to tell you something. Otherwise, I may speculate, but I'm going to tell you I'm speculating. Mm -hmm. because it doesn't pay me to mm -hmm. say anything that I can't show you. I, everything I say is defensible, or I'm not saying it. Mm -hmm. That um, is cool. Well, you, yeah. you, can, you can check it all out in the two films, uh, and I would say, man, what a fun way to, to celebrate Christmas, to get people's interest, to look at the scientific, because I don't think Christians, it's interesting how we have this false choice of, of you either believe in God or you believe in science. That's ridiculous. Isn't that bizarre? It's the dumbest thing. It's a false it choice. Why do, why do people give you a false construct, a false choice? Because they're trying to mislead you. That's the bottom line. I agree. There. Let me attack that whole thing really quickly. I won't waste your time. <laughs> science, science is a method. Science is not an endpoint. It is a method. Maybe for, we used to say scientific method. Now we talk about science like it was a thing. It's a method. Mm -hmm. God is truth. Science is a means of finding truth. They're not inconsistent. And, and, and I'm quite convinced that any mature science will point consistently to God. God is truth. Science is a means to finding truth. If, you know, in mature disciplines, you're going to see evidence for God in the science. And that's why so many scientific disciplines have, are populated with Christians. Yeah. Um, it's only just a very few areas where it's, you know, you know, Christianity is verboten. It's because they have immature science going on, as far as I'm concerned. They wouldn't say that necessarily, but here I am. I can say what I want. I'm in my own chair right now. I'm saying. <laughs> when and, they catch up, <laughs> and, it'll and, finally point to God. And you, you say so much more through these two films. I would encourage you to get them. Uh, <laughs> Heaven and Earth set includes the Star of Bethlehem and the Christ Quake. And you can have an entertaining uh, and yes. educational and inspirational Christmas. That's it for today. Thank you, Rick Larson. Thank you guys for hanging out. Subscribe, share this, uh, follow, and join us again tomorrow with uh, Mark Driscoll. And uh, it'll be good. I, I can promise you that. So we appreciate you being here today. We'll see you next time here on Life Today Live. The come, the Spirit says come, the church says come. Let him that hear it say come, and let him that is a first come. They will find no drought in God's ever-flowing abundant springs of grace.